In 1775, the Continental Congress created the Chaplain Corps. Under the command of General George Washington, each soldier was required to attend worship service every Sunday. While other armies advanced on their feet, Washington's troops advanced on their knees. It's time for the Chaplain's Report with Caleb Colquitt on Tactics. Chaplain's Report is going to continue on in the book of Daniel. And we do want to take a quick look at that. So in the book of Daniel, you may recall if you have been paying attention to us, in the previous installment that we looked at, at the very end of chapter 5, King Belshazzar was killed the very night that Daniel predicted that he would be. And what happened is the Medes and the Persians took over the empire of Babylon and now King Darius is in charge instead of King Belshazzar. And now the Medes and the Persians are running things. So because of this, as you can imagine, there was quite a bit of political upheaval and rearranging of everything. And, and King Darius is starting to restructure how the government works and how it's uh, supposed to function and the jurisdictions and everything. It's, it's kind of like, imagine when a new president or a new governor comes in and he starts rearranging the staff and rearranging how things are done, but on steroids because he's not just a governor, he's the king. And so basically anything he says goes. And so there's a massive upheaval in the, in the castle, in the palace there. And a lot of it has to do with the fact that it was not uncommon back then for when a king took over, he took over the subjects of the previous king. And so those people that used to work for King Belshazzar are now working for Darius, and he's trying to figure out the pecking order here. And that's what we're going to see in Daniel chapter 6, verses 3 through 5, which reads, Then this Daniel began dis distinguishing himself among the commissioners and the satraps, because he possessed an extraordinary spirit. And the king planned to appoint him over the entire kingdom. Then the commissioners and the satraps began finding a ground of accusation against Daniel in regard to government affairs, but they couldn't find no ground of accusation or evidence of corruption insomuch as he was faithful, and no negligence or corruption was to be found in him. Then these men said, We will not find any ground of accusation against this Daniel unless we find it against him with regard to the law of God. This is a theme that Daniel was not unfamiliar with. You may recall very early on in the book of Daniel that right after his first big win, I guess, as it were, with King Nebuchadnezzar, he immediately had other people vying for his position and trying to undermine him. And one thing that it shows to me as a political commentator is that things don't change very much. Politics was a blood sport then, and it's a blood sport now. Now we're a little bit kinder about it, and there's less violent overthrows, but at the end of the day, it's still a bunch of people trying to get to the top and everybody trying to undermine everybody else. And this is what's going on right here, is that when King Darius is trying to restructure and figure out, okay, who's best for this position, who's best for this position, there are all these people that are saying, wow, this Daniel guy's rising to the top pretty quickly. We should probably do something to keep that from happening because we'd really like to be in that position. And so it's a, a very almost high school-esque environment here where there's constant backbiting and betrayal and trying to one-up each other. That seems to be the environment that is being discussed here in the scripture. And I think that it says something and there's a couple of big takeaways that we can have about the people that are doing this. First of all, it says a lot about you that you can't win unless you cheat. This is sort of a lesson in fair play because the bad guys, the ones that are the enemies of Daniel, rather than being better at their job or trying to get the position that they want through honorable means, they'd rather sabotage other people. They would rather cheat their way to the top than earn it. And I think that really does say a lot about their character and their worldview. That they're perfectly okay and perfectly willing to do whatever it takes 
to be able to one up this person. And we'll see later that includes the other person dying. They're perfectly comfortable with either directly or indirectly killing other people if it means they get to advance. And that really is a sad state to where you don't even value a person's life over your own position and prestige. It also says something about Daniel. I think it says something about Daniel, and it's something that we ought to emulate. That Daniel, being a man of God, his character is so above reproach that the only thing these guys can come up with to smear him, the only thing these guys can come up with to try to undermine Daniel and stop his rise to the top is use his loyalty to God, his devotion and his religion against him. That's the only thing they can come up with. They can't figure out any kind of way to attack his loyalty to the king or the kingdom. They can't attack the quality of his work. They can't attack his leadership ability. They can't come up with anything other than, let's figure out a way to use his loyalty to God as a weakness. And I think that that says a lot about the kind of person Daniel is, that he is somebody that does his best at work, that does his best as a citizen of the, well, technically he's not a citizen of the kingdom, he's still a Jew, but in his position and the, the place that he finds himself in, he does the very best he can to serve others, even though he's not in the ideal position. I'm sure that Daniel would have much rather been in Jerusalem, a free Jew worshiping God the way that God always intended. But even in this less than ideal situation, Daniel does the best that he can. And he seeks to serve God and to serve the people around him, to become a resource to them and help teach them about God. And we've seen in this story so far, he's had some limited success in that area. In some places, even though he's been able to teach, they haven't been very receptive to it, which isn't anything against Daniel. It's just that the people didn't receive God's truth as he presented it to them through Daniel. So I think it says a lot about Daniel's character that even though we're talking about secular work and, and secular positions here, that he's able to rise to the top because people realize that his conviction to God and his which crafts his character makes his character so above reproach that nobody can find anything to say ill about him. And I think it speaks to what we're supposed to do, that we, in our modern society, are supposed to do the best that we can to adhere to the law, to be model citizens, and to be the kind of person that you would want as a, as a neighbor, or as an employee, or as a friend. Christians should be the best of all those things. I think that it was Voltaire, who was not somebody that was a believer in God, who said that he wished that every single person around him would be a Christian, just because it meant that he was less likely to be cheated and that he would be surrounded with virtuous people. See, even somebody that didn't believe that God was real understood that a belief in God drives people to be better than they would be otherwise. And that's what's going on here, that Daniel is so driven by his devotion to his Lord that it affects the rest of his life, that other people can see how strong he is and how really unblemished his character is because of that devotion. And that's really something that we should try to do the best that we can as well. See, if we break the law, it's only because there was absolutely no way to do so other than breaking God's law. That's the only thing that we should do when it comes to the law. We should be the be doing the best that we can to adhere to every law unless it conflicts with God's law, which we're going to see as a theme of this chapter here in a moment. And it should also mean that whenever we offend someone or we say something that may, may seem unkind, we only do that if we have to do so to be in accordance with God's law. We make no meaningless or empty offenses unless we're doing so because we're teaching the truth about who God is. That in every respect, and that obviously isn't a license to be unkind when you're teaching them about the truth of God, I'm just saying that it means that if we ever have to lovingly correct somebody, we should never do so for our own motivations, or we should never do so overly harshly, but we should only do it because we know that they're in violation of God's law and there would be a problem, they would be in spiritual danger if we did it.
That's the kind of man Daniel was, and it's the kind of person that we should strive to be every single day. Stay the course, friends. You know, you really should like this video and subscribe to the Tactics YouTube channel. Oh, what's that? You want to know what's on the channel before you subscribe to it? Oh, no, 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 it's like Obamacare. So you gotta subscribe to find out what's on it.